Hello, this is Daryl Castle with today's Castle Report. This is Friday, the first day of July, and the year of our Lord 2022, and I will be talking about how the world, prodded along by the most powerful, seems to be moving inevitably toward a superpower war. This war, when it begins in earnest, will be fought between the most powerful nuclear-armed countries that have ever existed in all of man's history on the earth, I have talked in the past about how the world is dividing into armed camps of nations as both sides scramble at the last minute to find allies to bolster their teams. The war is mostly cold right now, and it's being waged economically, but ominous clouds have appeared over the Cold War that tell me it could go hot at any moment. Not much appears to be happening from either side. To reverse this road to World War III, the road to Armageddon, if you will, what makes any of the world's leaders think this coming war will not go nuclear? I don't know. I can't figure it out. Do they really think that a nation with thousands of nuclear missiles will lose a war or allow itself to suffer defeat with those missiles still in their silos? Apparently, they do think so, or at least I hope they think so, because the alternative is even more terrifying. How do world wars begin? We know for certain because we have two examples to choose from. They begin one step at a time, one provocation at a time, one escalation at a time, one insult at a time, until finally the camel's back is broken and it's too late. The economic sanctions against Russia have not worked as well as had been hoped, so new kinds of sanctions have to be found to ratchet up the pressure. When sanctions fail to accomplish the desired result, then escalation is the natural response recently. The small but NATO and EU member state Lithuania blocked all the items sanctioned by the EU from being transported from Russia through the safe passage zone in Lithuania to the Russian conclave of Kaliningrad. That was a provocation the Russians say they're not willing to live with. And the Russian language was strong enough to cause the EU, but mostly France and Germany, to tell the Lithuanians to back off. Apparently, though, the Lithuanians have given them the middle finger on the order for now, at least. The world waits for a country of two and a half million people to plunge it into nuclear war. It is understandable on the part of the Lithuanians because they suffered for decades under Soviet communism with its concrete building blocks, its lines to get a potato, etc. They don't want to go back to that. Who could blame them? But now they have Article 5 of the NATO Charter which would permit or even require NATO to respond to a Russian attack. So perhaps perhaps they're confident enough to be reckless. The Russians responded first with strong diplomatic language, but recently they announced that they would put nuclear weapons into Belarus on the southern border of Lithuania and Poland. That was a pretty clear indication of the intent to use those weapons if Russian survival was at issue. Russia has also begun cyber attacks against Lithuania. Putin, in his speech at the Russian Economic Summit in St. Petersburg, spoke as if Russia and Belarus were the same country, and in fact they are. Russian speakers, diplomats, etc., have started referring to Russia and Belarus as, quote, the Union. These are all ominous signs, and no one seems interested in turning down the rhetoric of these signs. The past week, this past week, there were two meetings on the western side of the world, one on the eastern side. The G7 nations consists of Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States, plus the European Union thrown in for good measure. They met in Germany for discussions on Ukraine, but much of the talk centered on inflation and energy prices. The decision was made not to sanction Russian energy any further, as the Europeans are probably worried about it. Winter and empty gas tanks for their heat. President Biden revealed his plan to bring fuel prices down by persuading the Middle East producers to simply produce more, thus solving our problems. Emmanuel Macron, president of France, was caught on camera and on a hot mic, thought to be cold, schooling him on the situation in the Middle East. Macron said to Biden, apparently in confidence, I talked with MBZ this morning. By the way, MBZ is the ruler of the United Arab Emirates. And he said he's pumping at maximum so he can't do any more. The Saudis tell me, Macron said, the Saudis tell me 
they might be able to pump another 150,000 barrels per day, which is an insignificant amount, but no more than that. The comment was heard around the world. The implication was clear. Joe, you have to solve your own energy problems. No one's going to do it for you. National Security Director Jake Sullivan pulled the president away from the mic as fast as he could. The president wants to blame his energy problems on Putin, but even his own energy secretary said no. No, it was a problem before the invasion of Ukraine. He wants to force Americans into green energy, but it is not available, and he can see the nation's economy crumbling around him, so he needs someone to blame, someone else to blame. This one is on you, Mr. President. You did it. You're doing it. I wonder how this president thinks we can fight a war against Russia and China on different sides of the world at the same time without energy. He's already drawn down the strategic reserves in an effort to reduce prices. Now he wants Congress to put a three-month hold on the gas tax. These are all just pennies. They won't do anything but fuel more inflation. NATO met this week as well. It met in Madrid, Spain. The talk there was about their coming hot war with Russia and how to keep the provocations coming until Putin just won't take it anymore. Seriously, though, folks, the Europeans seem willing to tone down the rhetoric. They refused any more energy sanctions. Why would they sanction energy any further? Since they're all cheating on it anyway, the big news is that Turkey has lifted its objections to Finland and Sweden joining NATO, thus clearing the way for two new NATO members. The Kurds have historic ethnic lands without borders, they say, along Syria's northern border and Turkey's southern border, extending all the way into Iraq. The Kurds say these are, are our generational homelands. The Turks say, no, no, that's not true. You're terrorists. The Turks are tired of these cross-border skirmishes and would not agree to NATO expansion until they had assurances that they would stop Finland and Sweden, lifted their arms embargo against Turkey, and pledged not to support the Kurds anymore and to cooperate with Turkey on counterterrorism. So, poor Kurds. This was a diplomatic win for President Biden, who pushed hard to get the agreement. In my opinion, it brings us closer to World War III, not further from it. For these reasons, Finland shares an 810-mile border with Russia, so rather than avoid NATO and Ukraine, Russia has another NATO country on its border. During the long 40-year Cold War, Sweden and Finland remained neutral, respecting an agreement made with Russia during World War II. But now I suppose it's time to forget all that, forget the lessons of history, just plunge ahead. Guess who pays for most of this, folks? That's right, you do. Because all those weapons go into Turkey as part of this deal, including advanced fighters, and upgrades for their F-16s come to U.S. arms firms paid for with your tax dollars or at least your future debt. Keep in mind, this is the same Turkey that bought S-400 air defense systems from Russia specifically designed to shoot down the airplanes the U.S. was selling to the Turks, so maybe the technology of those jets made its way back to Russia. Mr. Erdogan, the Turkish leader, imprisons his political opponents, helps Iran evade sanctions, consolidates his own power by undermining election law. So how can we tell friend from foe and all this? I know the Soviets used to have a barrier. Churchill referred to it as the Iron Curtain. The U.S. spent countless billions of dollars to keep it from expanding until one day it just collapsed. Now the U.S. expends countless billions of dollars to be the one doing the expanding. Russia screams that this was not the deal. This was not the way it was agreed. But no one seems to be listening on the other side of the world. Another summit was held this week in Beijing, China. The normal BRICS nations were there, consisting of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Those nations have ambitions of expanding the alliance to a G8, including three other nations. Only India is not completely decided and seems to want trade with both sides. India has never condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's never stopped trading with Russia, despite the sanctions. In the Beijing summit, Vladimir Putin announced plans for an international reserve currency. It will be called the Russian Financial Managing System, he said, or Messaging System, I'm sorry. And it is open for connection right now to banks of all the BRICS nations currently. That consists of about 40% of the world's population and 25% of the world's economy. Washington 
He imposed de-dollarization on Moscow, so Putin had to find some other way, some way around the dollar system. The Russians have been doing a brisk business, paying their payments in gold, so of course the West has imposed sanctions on gold transfers out of Russia, affecting Russia's ability to pay its bills. The North Koreans accused the U.S. of trying to expand NATO into the Pacific or form some form of Pacific version, including the U.S., Japan, and South Korea initially. There may be something to that containment accusation. Jordan's King Abdullah proposes a NATO-like treaty of Middle East nations formed to fight off Iranian expansion and terrorism. So NATO in both places, maybe. It's hard to see the divided Middle East with its thousand-year ethnic wars agreeing to anything so binding at the same time talks between Iran and the U.S. on Iranian nuclear expansion resumed this week in Doha, Qatar. So time will tell, however, Iran and Argentina at the same time have chosen sides by applying to be members of the BRICS. The U.S. and EU combined have poured about $110 billion into Ukraine. That's more than the entire yearly defense budget of Russia. What else would you call that but escalation in addition? At the NATO summit, the U.S. announced that troop strength in Eastern Europe would be increased to about 300,000 troops, which is an incredible effort. Europe will have to go on general mobilization to meet even a small part of it, so the U.S. will see its army once again deployed, this time against a nuclear power. The deployment is announced to include the 101st Airborne Division. This is the same U.S. military growing critically short because of recruiting shortfalls, especially critically short of pilots. While this commitment was being made in Europe, the U.S. began construction on an advanced air base on the Pacific island of Tinian. You might recall from history that Tinian was paid for with the blood of U.S. Marines in World War II, and from it, a lone B-29 named Enola Gay delivered the atomic bomb over Hiroshima. This base is apparently intended as an insurance policy against the possible loss of Guam, I suppose, to Chinese missiles. Estimated completion date in about 12 months. China has been undergoing a massive military buildup for many years. The North Koreans just completed their seventh nuclear test. South Korea is reaching out for closer ties to NATO countries. China is expanding worldwide, especially in Africa, the Middle East, Now China is the largest training partner in Latin and South America. When they work a deal to colonize some country, the Chinese import from China everything in the deal except a little local labor. The deal seems great to whatever warlord runs that country. Then all of a sudden, after a while, it's obvious they're being robbed. It's hard for the U.S. to counter these deals because the main thing we have to sell is weapons and our new ideology, of course, which doesn't work well in Africa or the Middle East or Latin America. Such an opportunity for America if we just had competent people in charge. In conclusion, a NATO strategy document that lists China as a strategic threat said it is contesting the rules-based international order. Who makes these rules but the U.S.? And China has announced very clearly it's seeking a new international order outside the U.S. dollar-denominated system, so not surprising. The U.S. continues to threaten, provoke, and bluster, as does China. Sooner or later, some small spark will set it off. Missiles will fly. I pray to God. I'm wrong, folks. Finally, folks, it's clear to me that Joe Biden is not in charge of much of anything. The administration and corporate state appears to be running things. For example, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, appointed the head of BlackRock Financial, which does a huge business in China as its pivot to Asia point man responsible for containing China. He doesn't want China contained, neither do the other revolving door corporate heads that run U.S. foreign and diplomatic policy. The people who run U.S. China policy do not want China contained because they make billions from China. My view is that we do not have a functional central government anymore. Not at all. We're just an arm of the corporate, administrative, unelected, unaccountable state. They have us headed toward a catastrophic war, at least that's the way I see it. Till next time, folks, this is Daryl Castle. Thanks for listening.